I began this series on the book of Hosea, and I titled it A Picture of God's Love. And today I'm titling my message, A Timeless Picture of God's Love. And, you know, the greatest slogans and sayings say everything that you need to know in just a few words or a very brief statement. You know, here are some examples that I'll mention to you, some of which you probably, hopefully, heard before. And, and if you know the answer, just shout it out as it comes along. A diamond is forever. You know that that term was coined in 1948 by De Beers Diamonds. And it was said that up until that moment, from 1930 to 1948, most brides uh, did not get a diamond ring for their engagement, they would receive just a simple wedding band. But from that point forward, it told every guy in the history of humanity that if you like it, you better put a ring on it and a diamond ring on it at that. And according to De Beers, and I believe that it's true, after that moment, eight in 10 brides had a diamond engagement ring. You see, that little slogan didn't just benefit their company, it benefited every jewelry salesperson for the last 70 years. Um, And um, how about this one? Maybe she's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. We got a makeup lady here up in the front. I knew, I knew you'd know that one right there. And it went for, uh, I believe, 24 years straight until 2015 when they retired it for a slogan, make it better, uh, which for me, it's like, that. why did you change it? Your initial, oh, make it happen. That's what it was. The new one's make it happen. The fact that I can't remember it tells you it's probably not a very good one. Um, but it told every woman watching TV, oh, sure, those ladies are naturally beautiful, but maybe it's our makeup that makes them look that good. And so one layer of inception deeper was if you buy our makeup, maybe you'll look that good too. Um, Here's another one. Just do it. That term was coined, that slogan was coined almost 30 years ago uh, by Nike. And on television, you know, I grew up watching these commercials. You'd see these just cut athletes that look a little like me. Um, and <laughs> that is not funny. That was not a joke. Okay, I, I begged for it. I did it. I did it. And, and, you know, they're doing these feats, the high jump, they're swimming, all these different kind of athletic endeavors. And as you're watching the screen in the end, it just says, just do it. And you think to yourself, that could be me. For 88, 88 for these shoes. 2497 for the totally sweet mesh shirt. And 1698 for the quasi water resistant male yoga pants. <laughs> My dreams, athletically, could be fulfilled entirely. And then, of course, there was Steve Jobs' favorite, famous slogan, Think Different, that epitomized every product that they had ever put out, that his uh, fans, boys, uh, so, and gals, so to speak, have always identified with. You know, there's another one that probably has done a lot of damage in our society, unfortunately, that we bought hook, line, and sinker into. It says, you know, it, it says this, for there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. You know what it taught us to do? Swipe that card, charge it up. And it, they, they just even put it out there and said, yeah, you know, we know that money can't buy happiness, but let's give it a shot anyway and <laughs> call it into debt. Or who can forget the famous saying, got milk, you know? It, it taught all of us to love and, and drink milk, you know, famous one, melts in your mouth, not your hand. Uh, here's another one, can you hear me now? Uh, like a good neighbor, State Farm is... There, uh, the few, the proud, the... And again, every one of those slogans said everything they wanted you to know about their brand in just a tiny few words. Now, I could go on and list a lot more, but we're not here to talk about marketing slogans. We're here to talk about the Word of God, right? That's why we came here uh, in church today. And and the point, though, that I want to relay to you is that companies figured out a way to make you and I view their stuff, not just as stuff, but essentially as an intrinsic connection between you and that 
entity so that you wouldn't just view the things that they sell as things, but you would view the things that they sell essentially as an extension of who you are as a person. And so the next time they release a new thing, which they'll convince you was way better than their last thing, you'll want to buy it because you don't just view it as a product, you view it as a connection to who you are. So here's what I submit to you today. I submit to you that the entire book of Hosea is a timeless symbol for every person of faith of God's love for you and I. And my hope would be that every time you crack open your Bible and you just see the title there in the table of contents or you flip through it or you read it, that it would draw you to remember God's love for us, God's contention for us despite our wanderings and God's heart to restore even the most despicable. It's an absolutely beautiful yet timeless picture meant to evoke two questions. And when you came in today, You should have gotten a note sheet, and it's one of the ways that we follow along with the message and we participate. And uh, the first section there just really lists out the two questions that I hope you ask yourself every time you see the title of the book of Hosea or every time uh, you read the book of Hosea. And the first question that I hope the book of Hosea as a timeless brand evokes for you is how could God love us like that? How could God love us like that. And just to give you a little bit of a recap of what the whole book is all about, God tells Hosea, this prophet, to go and marry this prostitute by the name of Gomer. And he buys her out of her life of sex slavery. And for a while, things are normal and good. And before too long, Gomer returns to her life of sex slavery. And so Hosea, the prophet, finds the local brothel where his wife is currently employed, pays off her pimp who has writes to her during that time and says, will you come home? Will you come home? We'll work it out. Just come home. And he does it again. And for a period of time, things are nice and fine. And she just keeps going back into that same life over and over again. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that I could be married to someone who perpetually cheated on me. Now, I want to be very careful and say that if infidelity has happened in any one of your lives, it is something that is overcomable. Uh, It is overcomable with counseling. It is overcomable with, with forgiveness and a process of healing and a process of time. But with that being said, it takes two willing partners willing to work on it and move forward, right? Right. And if one of the two partners at any point doesn't want to participate in the process and wants to continue going back to other lovers and other things other than the marriage, what they're doing by definition is violating and breaking the bond of the marriage perpetually over and over. And so in this Uh, depiction with Hosea and Gomer. Gomer shows little regard for her husband throughout the entire book, and yet he keeps going back to her. And he keeps buying her back, taking her home, and doing it all over again. You know, the whole point of the entire book is that you and I would understand that in the picture, we are Gomer. And just like we look at Hosea and say, why would you keep buying her back, knowing what she's going to do, knowing what she's done already? The whole point of the book is that then you would look at yourself and relationship to your God and say, how does God keep buying me back? How could that God love this guy who's standing in front of you right now? I don't get it, but all I can do is accept it, receive it, and pledge my love back to that God today. Uh, Just a quick show of hands. Did I officiate anyone in here's wedding ceremony? Okay. I know I didn't officiate yours, Mary Jo, but that is funny for raising your hand. Um, (laughs) Anyway, there was a couple, first service. But if you've ever seen one of my wedding sermons, for the first seven years, it was essentially, not essentially, it was the same one every single time. I'll just confess it to you right now. I've added a few more to the book since then, but it was so good. I just went with it every single time. And one of the things that I say during the the ceremony is I I have the husband and the wife-to-be looking at each other, and, and I address them, and I say, you know, your spouse already loves you. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. All you can do today is receive it and pledge your love back to them. And then I turn to the other person and I say, you know what, your spouse, they already love you. You can't earn it, 
You can't work for it. Today, what you can do is receive it and pledge your love and your faithfulness and commitment back to them. Now, human love inevitably fails and runs short, doesn't it? Even the best of promises made with the greatest of intentions can run short because we're fallen. Uh, There are all kinds of patterns in life that come into play. And sometimes the love that started at the altar uh, can look very differently uh, years down the line. But the point that I'm trying to communicate to you right now through this illustration is that the only thing that we can do is to receive God's radical Hosea the prophet style love accept it. We can't earn it, uh, but we can receive it and pledge our love back to him in response. So church, every single time that you see the title, Hosea, every time that you read the book, I hope that you look at yourself and your own heart and say, how could that God love this person? that is in the mirror in front of you. Here's a second question that I hope the book of Hosea evokes for you as a timeless brand in your faith. Where is Hosea's wife trying to show up in my life today? Where is Hosea's wife trying to show up in my life today? You know, the longer we're Christians, the more like Christ we should become, right? One person thinks we should become like Christ in church. (laughs) You're going to heaven. You have assurance. The rest of you, I have no idea what your all situation is. But I'll just say it ain't looking good because that's like the easiest question in church right there. So I'm going to give you one more chance because this is like, you know, salvation hinges on it. The longer we're Christians, the more like Christ we should become, right? Yes, thank God. Okay, I was worried. My pastoral skills were struggling there for a while. Um, Our obedience should deepen our sense of understanding of who we are in Christ and what we're supposed to do as a result of that should deepen. Our compassion for people uh, should deepen. Our sense of the ability to forgive should increase. And, you know, we begin to understand as we're Christians that uh, this thing we call money, our finances, it's not just ours, that it, like it's from God and that we're supposed to live a certain way with it. We begin to understand as we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that the people in our lives aren't just arbitrarily or randomly placed there. Uh, like, you know, oh, that's my neighbor neighbor across the street, you know, just by luck or chance, they were there. We begin to understand as we're followers of Jesus, they weren't just randomly placed around us, that God actually had a plan, right? And God's plan was to put you and I in their lives so that we could love them and that we could model Jesus to them just like Jesus showed for each and every single one of us. Um, And and so, you know, we begin to understand that our day-to-day life is actually our mission field. Uh, There are parts of our lives that we didn't know that we were doing wrong. And God starts to peel back the scab a little bit. And he says, hey, I'm interested in that. I want to know what's underneath that, not because I want to judge you, but because I want to heal what's down there, and you just kind of turn the other way, and you don't want to listen, and the more you're walking with Jesus, God starts pointing at different things, but not in a judgmental way to put you down. God starts pulling you from who you used to be into who he wants you to be, right? Isn't that how the faith works? And and so within that, you know, you're you're, you're Christian. Some of you guys newer to the journey. Some of you guys have been walking with Jesus for a long time. You know, you have victories. You have some setbacks, and uh, at some point, though, you you, you, became, you become keenly aware of the reality, though, that even though you're a Christian, even though you're saved, you're still horribly fallen, right? And that old you has a way of just rearing its ugly head. And so the point that I'm trying to evoke from this question of where is Hosea's wife trying to show up in my life today is that when you see or read or interact with the book of Hosea, I would hope that you would look into your own soul. And Hosea's wife metaphorically represents the old life that uh, Christ called us to die to, that you would look inside yourself and say, where is that old me, that little bit of Hosea's wife that wants to run away from the things of God, where is she showing up today? Because the reality is, Every believer has a lot of similarities with the book of Hosea. If we're willing uh, to be honest about it, we're not all that different from Gomer. Uh, We're not all that different from Israel of Hosea's time who perpetually wanted to walk away uh, from the things of God. And just like Israel, you know, we frequently also fall into the trap of thinking that we can do everything on our own. That we don't really need God uh, that much. And we can figure it out if we just work hard or, you know, scheme on our own. We're pretty good at learning lessons the hard way. Uh, Let me ask you a question with a show of hands. How many of you would say that you identify personally with the themes in the book of Hosea in your faith? 
I think we should all connect with it in that level. And the whole point, I pray, happens every single time you read the book, is that you would ask yourself, how could a God like that love a person like me? And because of that, because of what lives inside of me as a result, where is Hosea's wife trying to show up in my life? today. Um, And so we're going to conclude the book today. We're going to go through chapters 12 to 14. Don't worry, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to highlight a couple of key verses for you along the way. Uh, If you would open up a Bible to Hosea chapter 12, verse 1. And if you're newer here and you don't know where the book of Hosea is or you're newer to God and Christianity, you can look it up in your table of contents in the beginning of your Bible. You can also uh, download the YouVersion app. It's my favorite Bible app of all of them. You can click on the more button and then the events tab where you can give online. You can take notes online. The scriptures are listed for you there to follow. And while you're turning and swiping there, um, we're going to look at a few key verses that basically sum up what I think was the whole message that Hosea was trying to communicate to Israel at that time. So hopefully by now you're there, but before we read the word of God, I'd ask you to go with me in prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that you bought us back out of our sin, out of our iniquity, out of our bondage, out of our just ugliness. You stepped into the metaphorical brothels of our lives and paid the price with the blood of your son, Jesus, so that we could live and walk in freedom. And today, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see what you want us to see. We pray that you would open our ears today, that we would hear what you want us to hear. And Spirit of God, we ask that you would just open up these cold hearts today so that we would respond and become the disciples that Jesus wants us to be. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hosea 12, 1, we'll start there. It says, Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. And I'll just push pause there and uh, just say that basically what Hosea is telling Ephraim, which was one of Israel's tribes, was that they were feeding on the eastern wind and pursuing it all day long. You've probably heard the phrase that someone chasing after the wind and and the vanity involved in such an effort. Basically what they were doing was they were trying to make covenants with two enemy nations in hopes that neither would attack them. They were offering gifts to the Assyrians over on the one side and then bringing oil down to Egypt. Basically it was a financial payoff of sorts in hopes that neither one of them would do anything bad to the nation. They had the money at the time, uh, but the problem with it was that it really didn't make either enemy nation happy, and it infuriated God. God had told them that they were supposed to show uh, that he was truly God. They were supposed to trust him to uh, provide for themselves with just the Lord. And uh, here, they were doing just the opposite of that. And basically, they were trying to do things their own way, or as I would refer to it, they were trying to do things the human way. And so this takes me to the next section on the note sheet of Hosea's closing remarks for the book. First thing I want you to write down is, when tempted to do things the human way, choose God's ways. When tempted to do things the human way, choose God's way. You know, we see this theme pop up in the book of Hosea over and over again. Uh, Gomer tried to do things her own human way by providing for herself through sex slavery in a way that she knew how to do that gave her what she needed right then and right there when she had a home that she could go to in her husband. Israel was doing the exact same thing as a representative of the entire nation. Israel was perpetually trusting in foreign alliances and their financial wherewithal and security rather than trusting in God uh, to provide for him. Let me read to you what the Amplified Bible says of, uh, of uh, Hosea 12.1. The Amplified Bible reads it this way. Ephraim feeds on the emptiness of the wind and continually pursues the parching east wind, which brings destruction. Let me ask you a question with a show of hands. How many of you are so hot this summer that you want to go pitch a tent in the fridge room at Costco? By the way, that thing is amazing. If you've never been in there on a hot summer day, it's like, oh, thank you, God, you're real in the world. Um, Man, it has been hot, hasn't it? And it's about to heat up again. Uh, But on a hot summer day, a nice cool breeze is pretty refreshing, isn't it? But we've had a few days recently 
where even the wind was hot. You know what I'm talking about? And you kind of think to yourself, well, it's better than no wind at all, right? You know, but it's, it's not really satisfying at all. Well, here's what I want to point out to you. The climate of Israel is actually in, remarkably similar to the climate of Southern California. See, on the east was the desert and the wilderness. And everything out in the eastern side was what the Israelites weren't supposed to pursue. It was where they weren't supposed to go. And uh, so the wind that came out of the wilderness, not only was it hot and parching, similar to how here when the winds shift, we call it the Santa Anas. It's that hot wind from the east. Well, the same thing would happen with them. When the wind would shift from the east, it was, it was hot and, and it wasn't refreshing, but it was also representative of who was on the other side. Because who was on the other side was all the nations and everything that they weren't supposed to pursue or find fulfillment in. And, and so the nations were always there. The nations had money, they had resources, the Israelites, uh, you know, interacted with them, but they weren't supposed to pursue that form of life. And yet it says, uh, the, the, the author here is trying to communicate that what they were doing was chasing eastern winds that not only were unfulfilling, uh, but actually were destructive to them. And so here's what I submit to you. When we do stuff the human way rather than God's way, not only is it unfulfilling, but it's also destructive. And I want to just get you to think about inside of your own heart today, are there any places where you are pursuing eastern winds that are not only unfulfilling, maybe it feels like, well, it's just like that hot wind, it's better than nothing, but Really, it's, it's actually destructive to who God wants you uh, to be. I'll tell you what, it has never been easier than today to live a life without God. You know, you feel like you don't have the information that you're interested in, Google it. If you feel lonely or disconnected from the people that you care about in your life, FaceTime them. If you feel like, you know, you, you don't have any friends, log, log on Facebook, friend a bunch of people. If, you know, if, if you get sick, go to WebMD, go to, go to the doctor. Uh, you know, if, if you want to travel somewhere, work hard, save the money, go on kayak.com or whatever your personal website of choice is, book the ticket and plan for the dates. And within two to 20 hours, you can be anywhere you want to be in the world as far away from reality as you could possibly imagine. Uh, you know, we think that we have the answers to every situation that life could ever throw at us. That is until you face a situation so dire that only God can answer it. And what happens and what God was warning the people of Israel in Hosea's time and the same thing that happens to us is God was telling them, listen, you keep chasing after those eastern winds when it gets to the point where it's that bad, I'm not going to be there. Not because God moved or God doesn't love you, because there comes a point in life where God gives us over uh, to the debauchery of our ways. And, and so uh, God wants you and I to make each decision with him. God doesn't just want us to be a part he doesn't just want to be a part of our little information gathering process. God wants to be a part of every single thing that I do. You know, we had a great prayer and worship night out here in the courtyard uh, last Wednesday night. It was amazing. And I can honestly tell you, I feel like God was there. And it's not because the band was amazing or somehow we're special, which, by the way, they're great. Love them. They're, we lo our worship team is my favorite worship team of all time. I'll put it out there. Um, but that's not why God was there. God was there because his people gathered in his name to seek his face. And the Bible tells us that when we gather corporately for worship, that in a unique way, God shows up that he doesn't in other ways and other aspects of our lives. Just like, by the way, I believe God's here this morning as we corporately as a church seek his face uh, to praise him for who he is, to thank him for what he's done, and to ask him to speak to us in the midst of our life circumstance that we may be facing uh, right now. Uh, you know, this is great, but God doesn't just want to be with us when we're here in church. God wants to be with us during every moment 
of every day. God wants to be with us on Monday. He wants to be with us on Wednesday. He wants us to be there with him and he wants us to be there with him and and him to be with us in the office uh, when we face a major life decision, when we're thinking about the decision, when we're coming down to the decision, after the decision, when we hear the diagnosis that a loved one isn't responding well to treatment, God wants to be with us and meet us in that process. When a loved one actually passes and steps into whatever's next for them, which prayerfully they know Jesus, uh, God wants to be there with us in every step of that journey too. Uh, God wants to be a part of the victories in our lives. God wants us uh, to commune with him in the lonely parts of our lives. God wants to be with us and us to be with him in every part of our lives. See, this God didn't buy you and I back so that we could just keep chasing after eastern winds. He bought us back so he could be with us and so we could then go and be with him. And so I wanna tell you, next time you're tempted to do things the human way, choose God's ways. Here's the next thing I would have you write down uh, in the note sheet. When tempted to do things an old way, choose a new way. When tempted to do things an old way, choose a new way. And in chapter 12, verses 2 through 9, I'm not going to read it, but uh, what I will say is Hosea ties Israel and Gomer's spiritual deception to its roots to their forefather, Jacob. Now, if you're newer to faith and you don't know who this guy by the name of Jacob is, uh, Jacob was a guy in the Old Testament, one of the forefathers of the faith, and he was known for being a trickster. In fact, his name meant heel grabber, which is also can be translated uh, trickster. And his whole life, he He was a schemer and a striver. And in uh, chapter 12, verse 3, it describes Jacob as a person who in his manhood strove with God. And in that context, it's not a good way of, of putting it. It's basically saying the guy was always fighting God to try to get what he wanted. And ultimately, he picks a giant fight with God. And if you know the story, he meets this angel of the Lord. uh, And shocker, he loses the fight. (laughs) Which, by the way, that should be one more little uh, thing to, to just say. If you pick a fight with God, you can put money on who the winner's going to be. And what winds up happening as a result of Jacob striving and scheming and fighting with God is that he was left with a limp for the rest of his life. And he came out of that experience, though, a different person. And so what Hosea is telling Israel uh, is this, because if you know the story, Jacob actually came out so differently, he changed his name to what? Help me out. Israel. And so what Hosea is telling Israel at the time is they're just like Jacob, pre-Israel Jacob. They're deceptive, they're tricking, they're trying to scheme and strategize. And he's saying, that's fine. You can identify with Jacob, but identify with uh, post-transformation Jacob, who changed his name to Israel. Now, he wasn't perfect after that encounter with God. But if you read the Bible, uh, by and large, he had uh, changed dramatically after that encounter with God. See, deception, as I'm putting it, was kind of Jacob's old way of thinking or his old way of acting and living. And and that's how Hosea uh, wanted his prostitute of a wife, Gomer, to be after he bought her back. He, he wanted her to know she was loved, and, but he wanted to say, listen, come back, be a new person, and be a part of the family again, and re-engage the life here. And I believe that's how God wants us to be. As we reflect on our lives, when we wander away from God, uh, he wants us to know that he bought us back from our sin, and he wants us to go and live as a member of the family in good standing again. Here's what I know. You have a past, and I know that because I have a past, but here's what I also know. You have a present, and you have a future, and your past will keep trying to pop up into your future and into your present, and God wants you to know you're not that person anymore. Stop thinking that way. Stop acting that way. Start thinking like the new you who God wants you to be. See, Hosea was speaking to an Israelite nation uh, that was actually very prosperous at the time, but God was telling him he was gonna rip away all of their wealth and that the Israelites would be humbled again. And and another way that the old ways were popping up in Israel at the time uh, was kind of these shady business dealings that are mentioned in verses seven through nine where they were being deceptive and overcharging the merchants. You see, uh, a lot of people read the Bible and 
and the Old Testament specifically, and they get this idea that God just wanted to kill everyone except the Jews. Um, That's not what it was at all. You see, the Israelites were meant to live their life in such a way that they were a beacon of light and hope that the nations would say, wow, look how they do business. Look how they do life. And they would be inspired to become followers of Yahweh, the one true God. But instead, what the Israelite business people were doing with all the nations and merchants as they exchanged uh, transactions is they were just like everybody else, overcharging, tricking, deceiving. And so when the merchants saw them, they didn't really see anything different about this God that they claimed to believe in because they were just like them. See, the entire point is that old ways lead to exile uh, and new ways, God's new ways lead to freedom. And, and I believe that what God's trying to communicate here, and he says it very clearly in verse 9, is if you keep this up, I'm going to make you dwell in tents again. That's what God said to the Israelites. Every single person who read that, they knew what it meant. It was a reference to uh, the period right after the uh, the. Uh, the uh, What's the word I'm looking for, Christians? Oh, my gosh. Right after leaving Egypt during the period where they wandered in the wilderness. There you go. Um, And uh, God tells them, listen, uh, you're going to dwell in tents again. I'm going to rip away your prosperity. All of it is going to be gone. Um, And see, what God wants us to do is to be secure, to be secure in who he is and to be secure in his new ways for our lives. See, old ways lead to bondage. Old ways lead to exiles. New ways lead to freedom. Tell someone next to you, I want to be free. You didn't believe it. Say it again. I want to be free. Next time you're tempted to do something an old way, choose a new way, the God's way that leads to freedom. Here's the next thing that I believe Hosea would want us to know in his closing remarks. When tempted to think our lives are bad, remember God's care. How many of you have ever had a moment where you're on Facebook And you see somebody celebrating something great, and you think to yourself, my life stinks. Maybe you don't put it in those words. Some of you are like, that's why I'm not on Facebook right there. You know, there's this thing that happens in every single one of our lives, and it predates social media. It's been part of civilization since the minute that sin entered the world, that there would always be this tendency to look around and say, hey, you know what? I don't have the car they have. I'd be like, yeah, but you don't have the car payment they have either. I'll tell you what, in Jesus' name, I'm free from that. Amen. (laughs) Anyway, that's just, you know, mocking any of you with a high car payment. But, um, (laughs) and you look around and you say, man, you know, I, I, I don't have any major life victories going on right now. You know, I, I don't have the big house that they do. I didn't get a promotion at work. In fact, it's been a long time. Maybe I don't even have a job. I don't even know where I'm going in life. I've been doing this same old thing and nothing seems to be working. You see, there's this thing that starts to happen when we start to look around at everybody else and all the circumstances that we have where we just start feeling bad about where we are and who we are. And you know what God wants us to do in that minute? He says, stop and remember my love and my care for you. And in fact, this is what God says in Hosea Uh, 13.4, but I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me, there is no Savior. You know, and so next time you're sitting there and you're feeling bad and down about who you are and how things are going in your life and the relationships or the finances you don't have, God says, stop right there. Remember me? I am God, the one who brought you out of addiction. I'm the one who brought you out of the marriage problems, of the broken relationships of your past. I'm the one who healed you from that disease. I'm the one who gave you a safe place to live, who provided you with the job, even though it might not be amazing, but it's one that you have right in front of you to provide food for your family and and take care of yourself. Oh yeah, remember, I'm the God that saved you from sin. Remember that thing called eternal damnation and punishment? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Some of you are like, oh no, he's not going there right now. He says, besides me, there is no savior. When you were dead in your sins, you couldn't do anything to please God. God stepped down 
and forgave you and me. You know, Christianity is the only religion where you're not climbing a ladder to God. God steps down and gives the bridge to you through the blood of Christ so that we can just walk freely across it. And all God asks in return is that we start walking towards him, that we receive that love for ourselves and start walking towards him. And so the next time you're tempted to remember or feel like your life isn't what it's supposed to be, God says, remember how I cared for you, not just at salvation, though that was huge, but all throughout your life. Next time you're tempted to think your life is bad, remember God's care for you. And then Hosea goes on, and this is God speaking through the prophet of Hosea. And look at, look at what God says. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. In other words, uh, there was plenty of food to go around. And, and then look at what happens next. They were filled and their heart was lifted up. Therefore they, what does your Bible say? forgot me. You see, something happens when life starts to go well. We start to think, yeah, you know, I got this thing figured out. It's going well. And all along the way, they forgot God in the process. You see, we forget God's care sometimes in life. It's human nature. Sometimes we just forget to remember what he brought us through. Uh, I think this is true in terms of salvation as well as the storms that God brings us out of. I think we forget God sometimes during seasons of economic prosperity even. Um, at the end of the 20th century, America uh, was in a season of unprecedented economic prosperity. Yet statistics show that in the 1990s, churchgoers gave the smallest percentage of their income in tithes and offerings since the Great Depression of the 1930s. You know, we often think that we'll be more likely to give uh, when we have more money, but in reality, money is just an indicator of what's already in your heart. And if you couldn't do it when you have a little, you'll never do it when you have a lot. Next time you're tempted to keep everything to yourself, I want to encourage you to remember God's care for you and his provision for you in the past and, and offer the Lord what's rightfully his. You know, because Israel had forgotten God, the consequences were going to be so severe that they were literally going to perish as a nation. And Hosea, straight up in the next part of, of the book, he tells them, you're all going to die. <laughs> it's like that part in the movie, we're all going to die. You know what I mean? But he says, that's not the worst thing that's going to happen to you. Check it out in chapter 13, verse 14. He says, shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O oh, death, where is your plagues? Where are your plagues? O oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Uh, and so what Hosea was telling the people at the time uh, was that yes, they would indeed die, but that God would even rescue them from death. And if that little snippet from Hosea 13, 14 sounded familiar to you, if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, it's because it was also used by this guy who we know as the Apostle Paul uh, to describe what Jesus did for us on the cross and the resurrection life will experience. In fact, Paul took this, he kind of twisted it a little bit, and he gave it uh, the true meaning of what it was in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55, where he says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You know, at just about every funeral that, that I get the honor of preaching at, I preach that verse uh, because the hope that we have as followers of Jesus is that even death itself is redeemed and transformed by the power of the cross. And so Hosea was telling him things are gonna get so bad for the nation, they're gonna die, but God's gonna raise them up from the grave. And in the whole process of this story, it was actually a messianic reference hundreds of years before Christ would come to what Jesus would do for you and I. Uh, and Hosea, what he was doing was essentially pointing us to the cross as the true source of hope and care and love of God for humanity. And the reality is every single one of us in this room will face a moment in our lives when the sun sets permanently for us on this side of heaven. And from a human perspective, death is pretty much the worst thing that can happen to any person. Now, there are a lot of things bad that can happen to you. Some may argue there's things that are worse than death, but I would say it's up there, <laughs> regardless of how you rate it. But because of what Christ has done for us, the worst thing that can happen to us is actually the greatest expression of God's love for us, where when our lives on this side of heaven ends, God takes the sting out of death, he transforms our body to be like his lowly body, and we're reunited uh, with our creator uh, in heaven. See, friends, 
God's got you. <laughs> he loves you. Even the worst thing that could happen to you is actually the best day that's going to happen in the rest of your life. Um, next time we're tempted to think that our lives are bad, remember God's care. And the next thing that I believe Hosea would want us to know uh, is when tempted to walk away, run back to God's ways. And I'm going to read you verses chapter 14. Uh, verses 1 through 3. He says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words. And if you're an underliner or highlighter of your Bible, underline or highlight that little phrase, take with you words. And I'll explain why. He says, And return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us, we will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan, finds mercy. And so what Hosea is doing is he's pleading with the people here to return to God. And God uh, is saying, that's great. Uh, when the people come back, I want them to come back with, with a sense of, of conviction in their hearts. But that verse two that I had you underline or highlight says, take with you words. And I love that the prophet saw fit to put that in there. And here's why. See, God's saying, it's not enough for us just to have a certain feeling of contrition in our hearts when we've walked away from the things of God. God's saying, no, you need to vocalize and say, I messed up. I really blew it here, God. Will you forgive me? Then you receive the forgiveness of God and you actually say, you know what? I repent of this, God. I'm choosing to change my mind about how I uh, allowed myself to think about that and walk uh, in a new way. And so I love that phrase, take with you words. You know, we live in this society that says, if you're a Christian, all you have to do to make an impact is model the love of Christ. And I think that that's important to model. Obviously, that's what we're supposed to do. But in the same way, uh, I would think God would tell us, listen, take your words with you. Tell them where the source of your power uh, comes from. And, and so the, the fact of the matter is then God goes on. He says, listen, okay, if you change, here's what I'm going to do. And, and then God tells them what's going to happen in verses 4 through 8. This is what it says. I'll heal them of their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned from them. I will be like the dew of Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, what have, you to do with, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer you and look after you. I am like an ever green cypress. For me comes your fruit. And so he was telling them that in him, in God, was everything they needed for life. Church, here's what I want you to know. Everything that you seek out of life is found in God. Every sense of fulfillment that you long for right now, God will bring to pass in his perfect timing. And if he doesn't bring it to pass, it's because perhaps it's something he didn't see was best for us. And if we chase after things our whole lives that aren't best for us, at best we'll only hurt ourselves. You know, the financial security and freedom that you long for is found in God. The relational stability that you seek is found in walking in the life of Christ and in the community of the church. The healing that you long for in your soul or maybe even in your body it is found in the Lord. You know, let me tell you what this tiny little gomer inside of you uh, wants you to think. Run and grab all that stuff you want now. Any means necessary, at all costs, you go chase after it. You deserve it. You've earned it. And God would say, stop. Freeze, as I often tell Nigel. Freeze. <laughs> Take a breath and remember where your provision comes from. And Run back to the ways of God who will give us everything we need at exactly the moment we need it. And Hosea just ends the book so beautifully in verse 9 when he says, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. You know, the whole book of Hosea is about those who have wandered from God coming back to God and those who do not yet believe coming into an understanding of the love of God. And so I think there are two different types of people in here uh, today. And three, there's those who are walking with God, and that's great. Uh, and just keep on that. Keep loving the Lord. But I believe there may be some in here today 
who have strayed from the things of the Lord. And God's calling you back into his love today. God's calling you back into a relationship with him today. And there may be some of you in here today uh, who, if you're honest and you were to walk out the doors of this church, you genuinely don't know if you were to die if you would go to heaven. And one of the things that you'll hear me say frequently from this platform is that the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ means that four things are true for each and every person who believes in Jesus Christ, that God will forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future. He will adopt you into his family so that you can be his son or his daughter. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you can live the life that he has promised for you. And finally, he offers you the hope of an eternal life, that there has to be more than here, uh, that you can go and be there with him even when the sun sets on your heaven or on your earth and and you can head to heaven. Um, And so I'm going to give you a chance in this next prayer time, some of you to repent before God for some things, and some of you maybe to come to Jesus for the very first time. Uh, Would you pray with me? I want to start right now, and I want to give you a chance to bring your words of repentance towards Jesus. If there's something in your life that you know isn't right and God's calling you back to him, I'm going to give you a moment right now just to talk to God and use your words in the quietness of your heart to repent. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you bought us back at the cross. And God, I pray for repentance to break out in this room, in this church. I pray for the power of the gospel to be displayed in people's lives. And if you're in here today and you genuinely don't know if you're a Christian, I want to give you a chance to settle the question today. It isn't mystical. It isn't magical. The prayer that I'm going to pray for you, God just says, just pray it in your heart and he'll hear it. And once and for all, you can be a member of the family of God. Just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.